Hi, everyone. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. I, I told you I'd be louder than I thought I would be. <laughs> uh, my name is Dan Cerulli, and I'm joined here by Sepa Ebrahimzadeh. Not bad, right? Uh, welcome to the last session of Google Cloud Next. This is for you guys. Uh, I, I, I predicted uh, when I saw the schedule that uh, we would have no one in the last session, so I'm very, very impressed at every one of you for actually making it. Uh, and before we get started, I want to thank the people who are in the back who have been working really hard. They're the only ones who work really hard at this whole thing. Thank you guys for all your work. So Sepp and I are here today to talk about uh, authenticating service-to-service um, -service calls with Google Cloud endpoints. And uh, that's what you guys are here for, right? Right? Yeah? OK. Uh, who won a drone? Anyone win a drone in this room? Anyone win anything good down there on the floor? Nothing? Oh, Sepp, did you bring prizes? I did, yeah. Whoever stays till the end of the talk will get a prize. <laughs> okay, uh, besides the prizes that we don't have, this is what we're going to be talking about today. First, I'm going I'm to get started by talking a little bit about the difference between authentication and authorization to make clear what we're talking about. We are talking about uh, authentication today. Um, and I just want to be clear on, on what that means. And uh, I want to talk about real scenarios, why this matters to you, and, and where you might be already needing this, where you might be using it, or where you might use it in the future. Um, I do want to talk about Cloud Endpoints itself for a little while. I don't like to make product pitches, but uh, this is a product that's undergone a bunch of changes in the last uh, year. And I want to make sure you guys are all up to speed on where we are right now. Um, but then we're going to spend the bulk of this session in that, that let's get to it uh, bullet point. Um, this is a 200-level session. I don't know what that means to you guys, but to me it means you get to see some code. So Sepp's going to come up on stage, and he's going to show you exactly how you configure endpoints to, uh, to secure your APIs and exactly what you need to do to, to generate calls to make those. And uh, we should leave plenty of time at the end for Q&A and get you out the door on time so everybody makes their plane back to Moscow tonight. <laughs> Not tonight, probably. <laughs> OK, so um, uh, authentication versus authorization. Uh, those of you who came in here uh, on, on, an, on an airplane, when you, when you got to an airport somewhere, you had to produce a passport. And that passport is identification. And it, and it is used essentially to authenticate you. Uh, auth uh, uh, authentication token is a token that is uh, generated by someone that we trust and positive, uh, an authority that we trust, and positively identifies uh, an individual or an API call. Um, and it's different than authorization. And authentication just says, this is me. It's like your identification. This is me, and this is who I am. Um, it alone doesn't enable you to do things. But then it can be used to authorize you. So for example, if you've got that NDA visa, you might be allowed to enter a country. If you've got a driver's license, that identifies you. It's authentication. But it also authorizes you to, uh, to operate a motor vehicle in the state of California. So uh, what we're talking today is about authentication. And, and the key thing to note there is that you cannot do authorization if you haven't done authentication. I can't decide if you're allowed to walk through that door right now if you don't have a badge on that tells me who you are. So, so today we're going to be talking about authentication. Now, when might you use this? Well, um, how many people develop mobile APIs? How many have mobile apps, right? Those mobile apps make calls back to uh, a, an API frequently, right? That's one of the primary use cases that we've seen for endpoints over the last couple of years. But what we've learned in talking to our, our customers is that they've got a mobile API, and that's, we'll talk a little bit about user auth later. But behind that, almost always, more frequently than we thought, there are other services. And that, that mobile API that received that call from the mobile app is, is then making calls to, the, to other back-end systems. So there are ways to authenticate users, and we'll talk a little bit about them later. But you've got a, something in your, in your mobile app that's going to generate a credential, and you want to send that over to your, your back-end and, and have that thing validate that, that, uh, that, uh, that auth token and, and validate that, that you know who the user is that, that made that call. But the issue is that token that was generated to make that call, most frequently, you don't want that to be the kind of authentication that you use on those other services that your, that your mobile API is calling. You actually would like those services to reject that token. And the reason you want to do that is that you don't want that guy 
who, who has the ability to, to get a hold of one of those tokens, to be able to call your back-end systems. Generally, they're back-end systems for, for a reason. And you don't intend for them to be exposed externally. You don't want people calling them. So you need to actually to have different auth than, than you do on that front-end API. And if you're using App Engine or App, Eng App Engine flexible environments, all of those uh, you know, IP addresses are, are visible from the internet. And so you need something to be able to protect it and, and to take a different auth token than, than you're sending from your mobile app. Um, anyone uh, has ever heard the word microservices? Yes, you've been in this industry for the last two years. You hear it four times a day. You look at Hacker News. It's, people talk about it a lot, and we have a lot of customers who are implementing them. We've been developing, uh, we, we didn't use the term microservices at Google, uh, but, it, but at Google we've been, we've been doing this for you know, a, a decade or so. Um, and quite famously, internally at Google, we have a flat network. We don't, we don't protect resources from other resources via the network. Everything can address everything else. However, every single call that we make on our, on our uh, network is made with uh, authentication tokens so that we can identify which service is making a call. And we can validate, yes, that, that is a, 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 a caller that I trust. And the other time you might be doing this, and something we're seeing a lot with endpoints today, is customers who are not just developing services in Google, and maybe GCE, maybe G GKE, GAE, uh, but not just in Google, but they're also running things on premises. And, and they're developing services that need to contact each other, whether it's calling from, from GCP back to their on-premises uh, services or calling from uh, their on-premises services up to GCE. Um, some people attempt to solve, put security in here with networking, but that can be very difficult. And uh, if you are exposing IPs, it's critical that you can authenticate those calls. And it gets more complicated than this, and it's almost hard to believe, but. I'm told that we have customers who are running services in the middle of the Amazon. Sounds unbelievable, but it's true. And again, there it's even, it's even more, it can be more difficult to, to solve this security problem with, with any sort of networking issue. Setting up firewalls that can let, help you cloud to cloud and on-premise is very difficult. So it's just another situation where you, you want to be able to authenticate who your callers are. So that's a bunch of reasons why you need service-to-service -service authentication uh, today. Now I want to talk a little bit about cloud endpoints before Sep shows us how it can solve all your problems. So uh, how many people have used cloud endpoints in the past, in the past two years? Well, you, you might know it as a feature of App Engine, because that's what it was for a couple years. It was a Java framework and a, and a Python framework that you could use in App Engine that had, had a few different features, but was limited to, to Java, Python, and App Engine. Well, ever since last fall, and now generally available, um, we have really added a lot to the feature set. And, and first of all, we've made it so it's not just a, uh, an App Engine feature anymore. This is a, a product in cloud that can be used with any of our compute backends. And it's not just used as an API framework, but it's got these additional features that let you protect, monitor, and scale your APIs. So uh, one of the key components is what we call a distributed API gateway. And this is an architecture that we're now, we've been using at Google now for a couple of years for our APIs. We used to have an API proxy. And every call that you made to www.googleapis.com went through a proxy. And that did things like authentication and monitoring and logging. And, and we, we used all those systems internally. Um, but we found that uh, the, the, ex the extra network hop added latency. And uh, dealing with lots and lots of configuration that this thing had to know about was difficult as well. So we moved to an architecture where our proxy is actually a very thin proxy that gets deployed with each back end. So instead of having a, a proxy, a fat proxy that sits in the middle and does a bunch of work and then forwards calls, we deploy uh, in a container with each back end the proxy. So calls can get routed directly to the back end, and the proxy can, can perform that same work there. We find that it's uh, very, very performant and very scalable. Endpoints uh, is an open source. Uh, it's based on Nginx, which is an open source uh, proxy, and uh, is uses the same architecture. sits on on top of the same services we use for for our APIs. Uh, Endpoints is also deeply integrated with with uh, GCP. 
So if you're using uh, our App Engine frameworks, uh, it's built in. If you're using App Engine Flexible Environment, our proxy is built in. Um, if you're using GKE, we have a container that you can drop into your deployment. And of course, you can take our proxy and drop it on GCE too. So it's, it's deeply uh, integrated with the, with the back end. It also sends all of your monitoring metrics uh, to, to Google Cloud Console, where you have dashboards. It sends all of your logs to, to Stackdriver Logging. Uh, it uses a Stackdriver Trace. So it's for, for people who are developing on Google and, and developing new applications, whatever language you're using, uh, it, can, it can add these features that we're going to show today. Um, so we're, we're talking about authentication today. And as I mentioned, it also does uh, good logging. And I think Seth is going to show you a little bit about what the, the monitoring looks like later on. Um, and it's very, very scalable. And, and it's uh, also very, uh, very performant. Um, we find that at scale, it tends to add less than a millisecond of uh, latency to your, to your API requests. Um, many competing solutions add one or even two orders of magnitude uh, more than that. And again, to emphasize, this is not an App Engine feature anymore. Uh, you can use it uh, with any language on any of our compute backends. Uh, Google Functions coming soonish. So this is kind of what the architecture looks like. Um, you can place your calls from anywhere. Uh, here we show them from an Android app, an iOS app, uh, a, a browser. Of course, it can be another service. But all of your, uh, your web traffic is routed through a, this proxy. It's an Nginx-based proxy. Uh, and that's the proxy that actually does the work and decides whether or not a call gets through. Um, that thing receives config from a, a service we call the Google Service Management API. And then at runtime, it's checking in with something called the Service Control API. And that's the thing that's saying, hey, is this API key valid? Or can this project call your project? Um, and it's also reporting your metrics to, to Google Cloud Logging. And, and that's the thing that sends the data up to the dashboard. When calls go through, they get forward to your back end. And if, if a call is rejected, say it's not authenticated, uh, it never gets to your back end. Um, about a year and a half ago when we really started saying, hey, we want to handle any language, it was clearly clear to us that we needed an IDL that could describe these APIs. When we stepped away from the framework world, we need a way for you to tell us your AP, what your API is, um, no matter what language you're, you're writing in. And so uh, we looked around at the, the different IDLs that existed at the time, and we saw that Swagger really had a lot of traction. And we decided that we would adopt Swagger for this project. And just about the time that we started working with them, uh, they announced that they were forming the, or they told us that they were forming the Open API Initiative. So we became one of the founding members of the Open API Initiative, uh, along with a lot of other industry heavyweights, and are now brothers in arms Apogee, uh, to, to, to uh, join this initiative that owns the Open API specification. So we're using the Open API spec not just to describe the surface of your API, but also the config for how you want it, to, how you want us to, to manage it. So you use extensions in the uh, Open API spec to say, hey, these methods need auth, or use an API key here. Uh, and we really like that. We really think it's a, it's a, it's a powerful and um, uh, kind of imperative way for you to describe the way you want us to manage your API. Um, we also work with gRPC. Anyone here using gRPC yet? A few. Anyone heard about gRPC, New, uh, this, this transport that, that we're using heavily for our own APIs? Well, if you are using gRPC, then you'll find that there's probably really only one, uh, one proxy out there uh, that, that is really doing API management with it. Um, you can define your API in, in Proto for gRPC, and then you give us a YAML that, that describes the configuration, again, how you want us to, to manage it, what, you want, what sort of auth you want, and, uh, and we'll manage your gRPC APIs as well. Speaking of standards, uh, for authentication, we've chosen JSON web tokens, uh, which are pronounced JOT for uh, non-obvious non reasons. Um, but JOTs and, and oh, you know, OpenID Connect is kind of the kind of a, become a standard for, for authentication, and, and that's what we're using for authentication as well. Uh, we've got a couple of um, providers that we're working with. It's a standard; you can you can write them yourself. But if you're using Firebase or Auth0, we can we can validate those. And that's all I wanted to get through. And now I want to hand this over to Sepp, who's going to show us how the whole thing works. Great. Thanks, Dan. So as Dan mentioned, we have the best demo of the conference save for last. I just hope that it works. Um, what I would like to show you is a simple Node.js backend. Uh, let's actually switch back to the slide for a moment. That implements a REST API. And um, I'll show uh, deploying that REST API onto App Engine Flex. 
And then I'll talk about how we can turn this backend into an endpoints API. And we'll see what benefits we get from that in terms of the features that Dan mentioned, uh, namely logging and monitoring. And then the focus of the talk is authentication. So we'll talk about how to secure that API and make it so that all the clients who want to call it have to provide authentication tokens. And I'll talk about what the clients would look like in a different language. So imagine that uh, the Node.js backend is one of my services. And on the other side, on the client side, I'll have a Python application. And the Python application wants to call the Node.js APIs. And I'll show what that code would look like from um, GCE, if you want to run it from the Google Compute Engine, or any of the other compute platforms that uh, GCP has. Uh, and I'll also show similar code that runs from outside of GCP or from my laptop. And we'll talk about the trade-offs. So with that, let's go to the code, please. Seth, you did a good job of not interrupting me. Um, I promise not to do so well. But that's OK. Yeah, if uh, you want to heckle or you have a questions, feel free to interrupt me. Um, so let's take a look at the um, Node code first. It's very simple, about 20 lines, and it's based on Node.js Express. So we have a few lines here that define a uh, REST API. It's a post uh, method for the API that I've called echo. It basically expects uh, some uh, JSON content to come as the request that validates it that uh, it is JSON, and it just returns that, echoes it back in the response. Now, you could have uh, multiple other methods here and uh, you know, uh, expand your API to have uh, get calls, post calls, delete calls, or uh, multiple different paths for whatever your application might be. And there's nothing Google specific about this. You could write the same exact code in any other language. You could uh, write it in Node.js without using Express. And uh, I'm mentioning that to emphasize the fact that with endpoints, you will be able to use any language that you want, any framework that you want. You're not limited to a certain number of languages or frameworks. So that's all with the code. Let's go back and think about uh, from the client's perspective, what we need to communicate to the client to be able to call this API, right? We are surely not going to share the Node.js implementation code with them. And uh, you know, any documentation we provide them is probably going to be out of date and not convey the full message of uh, what's in the contents of the request, what they should expect in the responses. For that, we will use OpenAPI. The OpenAPI spec for this uh, simple API that has one method is also rather simple. It has one path for the echo method. It shows that it's a post method. And then it has some documentation uh, specific fields, like description, that can be parsed by uh, OpenAPI tools, like uh, the Swagger UI. Uh, and it can also be used to generate uh, client libraries for calling this API. The rest of it is about what the responses would look like. A 200 response is uh, defined to have uh, this type of message in it, an echo message. And the echo message at the bottom is defined here um, as a message that has a field, and that field will have a string uh, value on it. So, you know, rather simple. I just want to draw your attention to the host field here. I've named the API Echo API without auth. And the endpoint's end uh, keyword after is a reserved keyword. Then you see my project ID, the Google Cloud project ID. So the name of this API is unique uh, because it's scoped into the project IDs that are unique. And I can have multiple different endpoints APIs in one project. So if I want to, can I serve this from a different URL? You can, yes. This is not uh, the DNS record that you'll be calling your API with, because you might want to have your endpoints API be backed by um, uh, basically backends deployed on different compute platforms at the same time. Um, for the sake of this demo, I'll be deploying on App Engine Flex, but you might want to deploy on Google Compute Engine or uh, basically Kubernetes on uh, other cloud providers, or even on your on-prem uh, data centers. And endpoints should work in all of those scenarios. So let's go out of this um, OpenAPI spec and um, run a gcloud command. And gcloud, as I'm sure you're aware, who's used gcloud before? 
Great. GCloud, as I'm sure you're aware, is the CLI for uh, almost all of Google Cloud uh, products. And I'll be running this GCloud command that uploads the Open API specification to the control plane for endpoints. So I'm running GCloud service management deploy and then openapi.yaml. So what's happening right now is the Open API is sent to uh, the control plane. The control plane takes a look at it and validates it. So it looks uh, for any mistakes in it, inconsistencies. It also compares it to uh, a style guide that we have and we've published as the style guide for how to design your APIs so that uh, they're hopefully future-proof and uh, they're consistent. And after it's done persisting this copy of the Open API spec, it will return a unique identifier for that copy of it. In case I go to make changes to my uh, local copy of the Open API spec, this immutable instance of it is uh, persisted on the control plane. So if anyone's used App Engine Flex before, you'll know that it has um, an app.yaml simple configuration file that um, basically tells App Engine and tells gcloud what runtime environment it should use. In this case, it's Node.js. And uh, the environment is Flex, because the same command is used to deploy to App Engine Standard and App Engine Flex. All I've added to this uh, app.yaml file in order to turn endpoints on is three lines. And the three lines are endpoints API service, the name that I draw your attention to in the Open API uh, YAML file, and the unique config ID. So for the demo, I'll be showing two uh, different endpoint services side by side so we can compare them. But let me paste this here. Let's copy it again. and paste it here. So this is what Dan was talking about uh, with deep integration into App Engine Flex. This configuration is all I have to add, and I can go and uh, deploy my App Engine app the same standard way that I always do. Which and is the gcloud app deploy. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> And anyone who's used App Engine Flex will tell you that this will take quite a few minutes to finish. But I want to draw your attention to the URL that it spits out at the end to say the deployment has uh, completed, and you can call your uh, backend at this address. So I'm going to cancel this because I've already deployed it, uh, and I don't want to keep you waiting. And instead, I'll do a curl command against the already deployed uh, endpoint. So it's curl. It has a single header that says the application JSON is the format uh, of the request. And I'm sending it some data that says message and hello next 2017. So sure enough, the backend is deployed. It returns the same data that I sent it. Wow. Yes. That's awesome. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> this part of it you could have done uh, even without endpoints. So why did we upload the Open API spec? What did we get uh, in addition to what we could have done before? Well, let's go to the developer console and navigate to the endpoints tab. Endpoints alongside the Compute Engine, App Engine has its own page on the developer console. And you can see the different endpoint services I have. This first one is the one we've looked at so far. It's Echo API without auth. So let's go to that one. You can see that a monitoring dashboard, as well as log messages, have already been propagated uh, for this uh, endpoints API. Now, the metrics and the logs that are being published are API specific. There are um, latencies that were um, basically measured for each request. There are uh, error ratios as well as response codes in the metrics. And at the bottom here, uh, we have links to uh, the logs that were published for these requests. So if I click on one of these links, it will take me to Stackdriver logging. And I can take a look at one of the structured log messages that was published and see that it has a JSON payload. It shows that the HTTP method was a post. The URL was the echo method. And it has uh, API-specific information about the request size, response size, and latency, and so on. I could spend the rest of the talk just playing with Log Viewer here, because it's pretty cool. Who's used Log Viewer before? 
great. So you guys already know about it. So uh, people who are who are using App Engine are used to getting requests logged. But if you're running something in Compute Engine today, this doesn't come for free. You're not getting this with if you're using Container Engine or Compute Engine. But by putting endpoints in front of your API, you are going to all of a sudden you're going to be getting logs for for every API call that comes in. And 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 the dashboard that Sepp showed has some some graphs that look similar to what you see in App Engine. But what, what he showed at the bottom is it's all broken down by method. So you can not just see hey the 98th percentile uh, say for for our API is high. You might see there's just one particular method that has uh, a uh, percent, uh, latency that's high or that's getting increased error rates. So it's giving you uh, a higher fidelity of, of metrics and a higher fidelity of logs because we know about your API. Exactly that. So that's pretty cool. Um, we just uploaded our open API specification, which we were going to write anyways in order to communicate the surface of our API to our clients. And we got monitoring and logging uh, effortlessly. But the focus of the talk is authentication. As you noticed, I made the curl command from my laptop, and this API is open on the public internet. Whoever has this URL can go call it now. So how do I secure it? I have multiple options for doing that. I could go uh, and write a lot of Node.js code in order to expect authentication tokens in the requests that are coming in and uh, basically verify the signature of those authentication tokens and do all the hard work myself. Or I can configure endpoints to expect and require authentication for my API and not make any backend Node.js changes. So, you know, which one seems like the easier path? Let's take a look at um, the other open API uh, file that I have here to illustrate how many lines we've added. And the first section is all the same. The only thing I've changed is the name of the API to say it's echo API with auth this time. The rest is all the same, except at the bottom, I've added about 10 lines. The lines I've added, first, there's a security definition, which is an open API concept. Um, and the name I've given it is Google ID token. And I've given it a few different fields. The important one to call out here is that for a demo, I'm using the Google identity provider. And the issuer I'm configuring is accounts.google.com. Now, we will talk about other identity providers and identity provider hubs like Auth0, uh, Firebase, and other third parties that we support, as well as custom jots uh, after, after this part of the demo. The second part, if you're familiar with OpenAPI, is simply saying that this Google ID token um, security definition should be required for all the methods in this API. Alternatively, I could have required just some of the methods uh, to have authentication and keep the rest uh, either open or have multiple security definitions here and say these methods require that security definition, those other methods require another security definition. So we'll talk about why that might be useful. But let's exit this and do the same thing we did before, gcloud, service management, deploy this. Um, uh, open API specification to uh, the endpoints control plane. At the end, uh, after a few seconds, once it finishes, it will give me a configuration ID, and it has persisted this version of my Open API spec. And what I'll do with that, I'll copy the uh, configuration ID, and I'll put it in the application.yaml file for App Engine, just like I did previously. You'll notice a warning message here. This is one of the validations that it's doing. Uh, it's saying that the echo method is not protected with API keys. You know, it's asking if I'm sure uh, that I want to put this up because then it would be publicly accessible. Um, and it doesn't know that I have security requirements on this uh, method with security definitions. But that's the nice thing about having your open API uh, spec validated. That you can see any warnings and errors associated with it. So let me copy this configuration ID, put it in the app.yaml again. I'll comment uh, the echo API without auth section and uncomment this section. And again, um, I will do gcloud app deploy to deploy the same backend. Remember, we have not changed the Node.js code at all. And I want to compare them side by side. So perhaps I won't promote it to the production version of my app. And maybe I'll give it a different version. Let's call it with auth. 
And once this finishes deploying, it will give me a different URL. The URL will be with off, and the rest is the same. Uh, that's why I gave it a different version name. So I've also deployed this because I don't want to keep you guys waiting. Uh, let's go ahead and issue the same crawl command against this deployment. And sure enough, this time the call didn't go through. I got an HTTP 401 error, and the error has a message in it that says, JWT validation failed, credentials were either missing or invalid. So that's pretty cool. We just secured the API. It now requires authentication. And my work here is done. We can go home. Or maybe we should also take a look at the client side as well uh, and see how we can actually securely call this API now. Well, uh, for the client side, I uh, will demo two different scenarios. Let's say you're running on the Google um, uh, Compute Engine, uh, and you have a virtual machine, and you're running your Python client there. And then I will show you what it means to uh, run it outside of the Google Cloud Platform and either run it on-prem or from my laptop. So let's go to the developer console for Compute Engine. And I have a vanilla GC instance here. Um, and it's just sitting there doing nothing. So that's why GC is recommending that I can either downsize it and save some money or improve its performance. And let's just SSH to this. The nice my, this is one of my favorite yeah. features, by the way, of Cloud Console, is the click the button to SSH in. Okay. Right. Um, and the nice thing about running from a GCE instance is that for making my authenticated call, I can take advantage of uh, the built-in credential management features that all of the compute platforms on GCP have. So I have a service account, just like the accounts that you and I would have as human users. The service account has some credentials. It has a private key associated with it. On this GC virtual machine, those private, key, uh, those private keys for the service accounts are readily available. And I don't have to worry about securely copying them around or rotating them and so on. Let's take a look at this uh, GC client code that I have. It's uh, just a few lines of Python code. And hopefully, it's legible on the screen. Um, this is the service account that it's using the credentials of. It's next demo service account at uh, some URL that we have. What it's doing is first, it is creating a JSON web token. And the payload for the JSON web token is here. It has an issue at uh, field and an expiration field. And the important ones are that the issuer is the service account. The target audience is the Echo API with auth endpoint service that I want to call. And then what the code is doing is it's signing this JWT with the credentials of the service account that it has access to on the virtual machine. Then it uses that signed JWT to call the Google ID uh, provider and get an ID token. The ID token is also another JWT. It uses that JWT to call the Echo API. So we'll talk about why there is a two-hub step here and what the advantages and disadvantages of doing that are. Let's go ahead and test the code. First, without authentication. Sure enough, we get the HTTP 401 error. And I've added a simple flag here that says office uh, true or yes. And it is creating a signed JWT. It is obtaining an ID token with that signed JWT. And then it's calling the Echo API with that ID token. And sure enough, the request succeeds, and it returns the message that it sent it. And the th thing that, that's kind of cool there that happened is it is using default it's credential management that's available within GCE, any of the compute platforms. So you're not having to maintain a secrets file. You're not having to rotate keys. Th that's just going to happen automatically. You sign that JWT, and it's going to use the latest credential, and that will be validated by Google. Right. And uh, you might say, well, I don't want to run my Python client side on a Google Compute Engine instance. I want to run it elsewhere. You can do that too. Um, let's go to take a look at the service account that I just used in the Google Cloud Console. So under the service accounts page, I have the next demo service account that we just saw. And I can create a key for it. When I create the key, 
the credentials are downloaded uh, to my machine. Let's take a look at the credentials, and uh, you'll see that it has a private key in it. So this is the private key portion, and uh, from this point on, I will be responsible for securely distributing it to any place that I want to run my clients on and rotating it and so on. So let's close that and um, let's go back to uh, my prompt. And this is your laptop prompt. And right? this is my laptop. So you're and not it's running in Compute Engine anymore. Exactly. This is outside of the Google Cloud Platform. Uh, it's on uh, the Wi-Fi that we have here. And um, I have a slightly different client uh, code written in Python uh, for running locally. Let's take a look at that. Again, it creates a JOT. The only difference is this time it signs the JOT with the credentials that I have locally on my machine. So I have the private key uh, in the service account file that I will pass into the script. It signs the JOT with that. It uses that sign JOT to get an ID token. And then it calls the Echo API with that ID token. Right? So, so the thing to bear in mind here is you can run this code anywhere. If you're calling from on-prem to, to Google, you're calling from another cloud provider to Google, you, you have to get that key there. And, and you probably have methods that you're using for, for handling secrets in each of those places. But this, this file now is, is, is a, it's an important file. And any, anyone who has this has the ability to call your service. So um, on Google, you don't have to worry about that. When you're, when you're calling, when your service, what he's running in Python, is running outside of Google, you're going to have to maintain the, the, uh, the privacy and, and secrecy of this file. Exactly. So let's go ahead and test this one out. And uh, sure enough, the same thing. If I don't give it any credentials, the call fails with an HTTP 401. Uh, if I give it the service accounts, um, credentials file. It will create a signed JOT, get an ID token, and call the API with that ID token. So that's pretty cool, but uh, it shows the advantage and disadvantage of uh, running your client side on the Compute Engine or uh, App Engine or um, uh, basically the other compute uh, platforms that we have on uh, GCP. So um, we can go back to the endpoints dashboard and see the same graphs um, and see the uh, APIs running side by side. This is the endpoints API with authentication, and I've been generating some traffic against it. So this one will also have metrics, uh, and it also shows the 400 requests that were rejected because they didn't have authentication. So with that, let's go back to the slides, please. So what did we just look at? First, we looked at some sample Node.js code, and the code might have easily been written in a different language or a different framework. We showed that it implemented a REST API, and we showed how easy it was to write an open API specification that describes the methods, uh, requests, responses, and uh, documentation for that API, and that if you have the open API spec, you basically have an endpoints API, and you can get metrics, logs, and authentication out of endpoints uh, for that. And of course, we saw that uh, the calls we made uh, before we added authentication succeeded. Once we added authentication, the unauthenticated calls with curl or with the clients uh, written in Python failed. And the key point here is that uh, the response that was HTTP 401 came from the end, uh, endpoint's extensible server proxy. So those requests never actually made it to the Node.js backend. And of course, when we had authentication, uh, uh, JSON web tokens, the request succeeded, and uh, the response was proxied back from uh, the Node.js uh, backend. The few lines of code that we had to, the few lines of configuration, excuse me, that we had to add to the open API spec uh, are repeated here. The issuer we chose was the Google ID token uh, issuer. Now, why do we do that? We did that so that any service account on the project that I was using would be able to call the API. You might say, well, I don't want to use a Google ID uh, provider. I might want to use a third-party provider like Auth0, or I want to sign my own JOTs. Well, that's also possible with the same configuration. You just have to provide two extra lines that uh, tell the extensible server proxy where to get uh, your uh, jock uh, public key and what the audiences are 
for your JSON web tokens. Now, the advantage of doing this is that you're no longer calling the Google ID provider at all, that you can create a signed JWT and call your API directly with that. The disadvantage is that anytime you want to change the audiences or rotate your credentials, or uh, we should say change the public key URI, you would need to redeploy your backend. But the cool thing, let's look at other differences between them. The cool thing is that you could have, as I mentioned earlier, multiple different security definitions if you're using your own signed JOTs. And that way, do a bit of authorization too. To say the uh, JSON web tokens that have this audience can only call these methods in my API. The JSON web tokens that have those other audiences can call all my methods or these other methods of my API. And of course, the advantage of running uh, with Google ID token and on GCP is that the credential management and rotating of secrets is handled for you. So with that, I'll hand back to Dan, who'll talk about Firebase and Auth0 and the other features that Endpoints is planning. Amazing demo, Seb. Amazing. Thank you. And before I do that, I, I might point out that um, one of the sessions you elected to not go to uh, right now, um, and I just found out this last night, is our good friends from Vendasta, they're customers of ours, who are in one of these other rooms right now, uh, giving a talk on, on security at Vendasta. And what they're talking about is service-to-service -service auth using endpoints. So if you were torn between the two, you got pretty much the same material either one, because this is exactly what they do when calling cloud-to-cloud -cloud and calling within Google. Um, so we've talked a lot about service-to-service -service auth, and we talked about service accounts, or robot accounts, as we call them. But in that very first kind of diagram slide I showed, uh, I showed a you know, mobile device, right? And, and when, when a call is coming in from that mobile device, what you generally want to know there is who's holding that mobile device, who logged into that mobile app. Um, you guys have heard a lot about Firebase. Uh, Firebase is, of course, a great company that we acquired a couple of years ago. And I think they've done a really good job as an acquisition at Google of kind of maintaining a strong identity um, and also finding a, a great place within Google and in, in integrating well. They've really integrated well on that, that mobile developer. All of this, the tools that Google's producing, um, they have they have uh, done a good job of kind of consolidating them under Firebase. Um, if you are using Firebase, one of their features is Firebase Auth. And they have uh, good client libraries that you can use in, in uh, mobile devices or web apps that let you, your users sign in. And your users can sign in with username and password. They can choose their Google Auth. They can use Facebook or Twitter, a bunch of different identity providers. Um, they have a good client library experience for that. Well, if you are using Firebase and you'd like to put some logic and, and say, run it on App Engine or, uh, or any of our compute backends, uh, they, of course, are, are sending a, a JWT token as well. And of course, endpoints can validate that JWT token. Uh, there's a third party uh, uh, identity solution called Auth0 that lots of mobile developers are, are using. We work with them as well. Um, configuration there. Very, very similar, because it's all JOT-based. You basically tell us who's going to be issuing this, um, and there you will put your Firebase project ID, and, and you give the, the standard address for, for where to get that public key, and we can, we can validate those uh, JOT tokens. So that's the configuration you would use for your mobile API, the one that will be called directly by that mobile device. So. Uh, that's the, the bulk of the stuff that we wanted to talk about, give you a, a little overview of, of what endpoints is, talk to you about why service-to-service -service, uh, authentication is important, when you might use it. Did want to give you a glimpse of what's going to be happening coming up. Um, we have a lot of users. We, we uh, went full beta, and I think, in September. We've been GA since last month. We've got a lot of people using this. Um, the great thing about getting users uh, using your software is they start to tell you what's missing. And that's fantastic feedback. Uh, so uh, we've talked a lot about authentication. Well, our users want authorization. Um, we have a lot of people asking about that. And so you can bet we're thinking pretty hard about what to do about it. Also, very fine control. Uh, Seth mentioned one of the things you can do now is you can control. You might have some methods that you require API keys for and some not. And in his configuration, he was applying that policy to the entire API. You can do that uh, per method. But People want it even more fine control. We have customers who, who define resources within their API, and they want to control who has access to what resource. So if I've got my bookshelves API, maybe you get access
access to the history section, and you get access to the science section, but I'm not going to let you read history or you read science. Um, so, so we're looking at ways we might do that for our users. Rate limiting comes up a lot, especially for people who are starting to think about exposing their APIs to third parties. Um, it's, it's not such a big deal. With your mobile app, you rarely want to deny requests uh, to your own API to your own API, uh, but when other people start using your APIs, then you do think about denying your requests. Um, we have a lot a lot of other features that, that people are asking for and that we're starting to work on. So this is an area that we're really uh, investing a lot in, so uh, keep your eye on this space. And with that, I think you are looking at the last slide you will look at in next 2017. Uh, we both have Twitter accounts. I pay attention to mine a lot, and I ping him and make him pay attention to his sometime. <laughs> um, feel free to hit us.